despite the fact that I talk for a living, um, I don't uh, do dramatizations very often at all. So I'm a little stressed tonight, uh, and I ask uh, your patience. Uh, so you saw on your tables a, a mock front page of the Fort Wayne News Sentinel. Uh, that was all just to set the timing that uh, tonight we are at a pretend uh, Grand Army of the Republic meeting uh, in Allen County, Indiana in 1922, and I am your speaker. And when my kepi is on, I'm in character, and then I'll try to remember to take my hat off when I'm done, and then I will explain what parts I know are true and what parts I made up. And the only questions I can really answer is about what things I made up. Because uh, I'm not, though I've been there, I'm not a, a topic expert about Andersonville. Well, good evening, friends. As you've heard, Dr. Hedegar is sick with bronchitis. And he is assuredly the best orator that our post has ever had. And uh, he's well represented throughout the community. And he has spoken on Civil War topics at least as many times as I have said no to your invitations. But given the fact that Dr. Hedegar and I are the last two left alive and that he's sick with bronchitis tonight, I have uh, succumbed finally to the request that I share a few of my memories from during the war. I really don't like to talk about those days, particularly the days, the months uh, that my brother and I spent at Andersonville, but uh, I will do so uh, in the absence of Dr. Hedegar this evening. My brother, as most of you know, died at Andersonville and is buried there. And uh, he and I overlapped our stays for a very brief period of time. My brother Jonas, uh, he enlisted uh, 11 months before I did. Uh, he, as uh, others who were members of our post but uh, have gone on to their heavenly reward in the decades since, uh, he was a member of uh, the 30th Infantry, uh, Company H, here in Indiana, and uh, I joined 11 months after him, and I was in the 88th Infantry, Company A. And uh, we did that uh, partly uh, to help Dad out with the farming, that if we both left at once, it would have been a, a severe crisis, particularly in the fall. Um, uh, my brother left early fall, I left late summer, but uh, so we stuck around uh, as best we could while still responding uh, to our patriotic duties uh, to both enlist. Uh, we chose different units to enlist in, partly because of the nature of mustering at the time, but partly because we didn't want some dumb, lucky Johnny Reb artillerist uh, with one load of canister shot to take out the whole family. Uh, little did we know that uh, we'd still end up at some of the same battles because of uh, the way that our different units got fed into uh, the federal combat machine. And so we did see each other from time to time uh, in the era when uh, our service overlapped because we were at some of the same battles. But my brother Jonas uh, was captured uh, on the very last day of uh, the battle at uh, Chickamauga. Uh, he was part of one of the units that uh, uh, General George Henry Thomas successfully reformed in what otherwise could have been a horrible route, and uh, he was one of those that filled that gap, plugged the hole, and uh, saved the day for the Union, but unfortunately, he was one of many who were captured that day. 
And uh, he moved around to a couple prison camps and then eventually ended up at Andersonville. It took me longer uh, to catch up with him. Uh, it was at New Hope Church that uh, I was captured uh, after a number of battles. And uh, so I eventually ended up at Andersonville as well. Now, upon arriving there, I didn't know that my brother was there. There had been no correspondence coming uh, out of the prison camp. But, uh, of course, I knew his unit. And as soon as I saw people from his unit, once I got inside, I started to ask around if anyone knew about him. And sure enough, they said that uh, he was there. And so um, I, I, I had mixed feelings about that, but they, of course, immediately desired to go see my brother. But they told me he was in the sick tent area that uh, the many months that he had already been in prison had taken a, a huge toll on his health, and that uh, he had indeed uh, stopped eating, not that there was anything respectable to eat the entire time we were there, but uh, he could, at that point, only consume a, a little bit of broth daily. But I went to him in the sick tent area, and uh, we had a uh, a number of days, which we spent uh, the days together, and I was sadly with him at the time that he passed. That was a hectic week. Uh, he died uh, five days before the incident that many of you have heard about, when uh, the troubles within the camp uh, that had uh, devolved into lawlessness with the raiders came to a head. So uh, my brother died on June 24th, and just five days later was the day when things got so bad with the Raiders that uh, the camp administration gave some authority to the group who had been informally trying to resist those horrible actions of the Raiders. And uh, the, the good guys, uh, we called the regulators. And so on June 29th, uh, the camp administration gave some authority to the regulators. And the regulars, regulators set about uh, trying to dismantle the power structure of the raiders and eventually uh, brought them to a trial. Now, there were many dozens who had participated with uh, the horrible actions of the raiders, which mostly preyed upon the newest people to the camp as they came in uh, the front gates. But also, uh, over the course of time, uh, they preyed upon any weak person in any weak circumstance that they could see had any scrap of clothes, uh, any brass button left, anything that was of financial value to them that they could trade with the guards. And so it was just five days after my brother's death when I was still in grief that uh, the process of rounding up the raiders commenced. And uh, the, the regulators uh, were successful in getting uh, almost uh, all of them rounded up. And in fact, uh, the camp commandant, a worthless man, unworthy of the title of a human being, but nonetheless, one of the few credible things he did during his whole time of inflicting pain upon those of us in the camp was that uh, he did give regulators the authority to carry out some justice. And uh, so six of the ringleaders were hung. Uh, a few weeks after the regulators were, were given authority to bring some order. I don't know no, much what to say about that time. Uh, you've read uh, the excellent diaries that uh, were serialized in the newspaper many decades ago, and you know most of the stories. Uh, I believe that SOB Wirtz was given a uh, a rare privilege with the noose. I think the noose was too good for him. I think he should have suffered the way that those under his authority were forced to suffer. Uh, he should have been penned up with uh, putrefied water and with inadequate food and with no shelter and uh, left for nature to take its course. 
but uh, he was given the easy way out with the noose. And uh, as horrible as he was, I, I'm not convinced that uh, simply executing him really brought justice. I mean, there were a lot of horrible guards there, and there were a lot of horrible people in the Confederate structure who agreed to continue that system that was in place. People have asked me to describe Andersonville, and uh, that's hard. It's been decades, and I struggle. I still have nightmares, and there was nothing pleasant about that place. My mother always desired that I be a, a proper church-going fella, and I have to tell you that through my youth, uh, that was a burden on my mother because uh, uh, I struggled against her kind guidance. But uh, never after Andersonville did she have to remind me twice that it was Sunday morning when I was back at the farm. Because when you've been through hell, you believe in hell. And you have no desire to go back to hell. And I believe that I have seen as close, uh, closer than anything Dante described, I have seen hell by my year living at Andersonville. But ironically, I saw a glimpse of heaven as well. Many of you know the story of the Providence Spring, uh, that in August of 64, when dozens of people were dying every day in that hot Georgia sun, and all that we had was that swamp of putrid muck that was the only source of water, that God sent a storm, and a bolt of lightning came down and struck the ground, and a spring came up from that place that had pure, clean water. Now, in the decade since, there have been some who have suggested that this wasn't a real miracle, because uh, there was some evidence that the Confederate engineers in charge of building the stockade had known that there was a spring there, and they had uh, covered it over in their attempts to prepare the land for the stockade. And, uh, well, to me, that is just more evidence of the heinousness of their war crimes. But nonetheless, whether God had had a spring there forever, or whether, uh, and it had been covered over, or whether it was a brand new spring, the fact was that from the opening of the camp until August, we had gotten no benefit from any water until God sent that lightning bolt and that spring opened up. And uh, I am told uh, by those who have traveled back there, I have certainly not traveled back there, have no desire to travel back there, but uh, by those who have traveled back there, that that Providence Spring still flows clean water out of it to this day. People ask me who I blame for what happened, and I'll admit that uh, in the first decade or two, uh, I had even more bitter feelings than those that I still carry with me. There were some who asked uh, if it was right to blame Lincoln, because uh, if prisoner exchanges had been allowed, I could have gotten out of there a whole lot sooner. And in truth, I'd have been happier to have gone home, to have gone back to working on the family farm. But in truth, you know, within four months of my time of enlistment, uh, I was at Stones River. And at Stones River, uh, we had 12,000 casualties, and the South had 11,000 casualties, and it's not even one of the most famous battles of the war. It was just a couple bad days. But our nation would have ground itself to nothing with more days where we lost 12,000 and they lost 11,000 if 
we kept opening up the prisoner camps and swapping prisoners, uh, running them out of bodies to throw at the battle was the only solid strategy that Lincoln had. So though I much would have preferred to have gone home earlier, it's probably the only way the war was going to end. Some people ask me, was it worth it? And in the early years, I said, of course, yes. My family were abolitionists. Uh, we believed in the great principle behind the war. But then as Reconstruction fell apart, there were times I had my doubts. And now in the roaring 20s where we celebrate this great economy that uh, our country has, uh, I hear these stories about uh, what they call Jim Crow laws down in the South. And honestly, it sounds from the stories I hear as if some of the Negroes that we freed may not be any better off than they were 50 years ago. But I still think that the war was unavoidable. It was a flaw in the structure of the original fabric of our nation, and it was inevitable that it had to be resolved. Well, that's about it. Uh, maybe, maybe at our next session, Dr. Hediger will help be healthy, and, and he will give you, again, beautiful oration full of pretty words. But... Uh, there just aren't that many pretty words about Andersonville. But I invite you to join me as I think of my brother Jonas. I have my old cup that I carried with me. And so I say to Jonas, to the other almost 13,000 men who died there, and of the 32,000 like me who were there, and went home and survived to all of them, I toast. All right, that's it. That's the dramatic part. Now let me tell you what's true <coughs> and what I made up. Um, the uh, So... The Zimmerman brothers, Jonas, who is buried at Andersonville, and Byron and I have been there and we've, we've stood over the spot uh, where he is buried. Um, Jonas and John, uh, in the census he's John, though sometimes in family records he's referred to as Jonathan, but um, in, in his muster papers, it's John. So I just go by John. Uh, Jonas and John were brothers. Uh, they were my great, great, great uncles on my mom's side of the family. And uh, we know their units, the units that I gave you and the armies they were in, those were correct. Um, we know that Jonas was indeed captured on the last day at Chickamauga. And he was in one of the units that was pulled into the gap that helped save the day. Um, we don't know when John, the character I was portraying, we don't know exactly what battle he was captured at. But we know roughly the timeline. And so it's, uh, it's a reasonable guess. If it wasn't at New Hope Church, it was a battle within a couple of weeks either side of that. And since the... That there weren't many options for that. It still could have been a small skirmish, but but that's the most likely spot on the timeline when he might uh, have been captured. But um, the personage of the speaker I've stolen from another spot uh, in my family tree. Um, that on my dad's side of the family, uh, Frederick C. Barrett uh, was the next to last surviving veteran in Allen County, Indiana. And uh, 90 years ago, at uh, the last GAR meeting that he was able to attend, this was the bunting at the head table. And uh, 
this makes me choke up a little, but um, this is the cup that he carried in the Carolinas campaign. Uh, he was an, uh, he was enlisted, but he was an aide to an officer. And uh, he was there uh, when Joseph Johnson surrendered on April 18th. And I know that for 50 years, nobody drank out of this because it was in my dad's dresser drawer. And um, I doubt that anyone did for the 50 years before. And uh, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell the story of a couple random ancestors of mine. And uh, other than answering questions about what I made up, uh, other than the fact that I've been there and I've seen the movie repeatedly,